Note, this is the complete guide to making Luminol with all the details. It's rather long, so if you want just an overview of the process, then please watch the abridged guide. Warning. Despite being made entirely with domestically available chemicals, many of the procedures and intermediate products are toxic or corrosive, so a fume hood and gloves are needed. This should be performed by, or under the direct supervision of, an experienced chemist. Greetings, fellow nerds. In this video, we're going to make luminol, a really famous chemiluminescent substance. First, I need to crush your expectations. Making luminol this way is thousands of times more expensive than buying it directly. It is also extremely time consuming, complicated to perform, and the yield are extremely low. Our objective here is to explore the science. Okay, first let's plan out our strategy. Our synthetic approach is going to start from diethylhexyl phthalate. Then we hydrolyze and neutralize it to disodium phthalate, acidify it to phthalic acid, dehydrate to phthalic anhydride, nitrate it to 3 nitrothalic anhydride, hydrolyze it to 3 nitrothalic acid, condense it with hydrazine, then finally reduce the nitro group to amine and form our target luminol compound. While there are shorter routes to luminol, this approach can be performed with domestically available chemicals. So let's get started. First, we need to get diethylhexyl phthalate. This is actually found in vinyl gloves, and these are usually sold in pharmacies. Look for the ones that say they are made with PVC. PVC, or polyvinyl chloride, is a very rigid polymer. So to make the gloves flexible, diethylhexyl phthalate is added. To extract it, we get 50 grams worth of gloves and cut them up. Then we add isopropanol, also known as rubbing alcohol, to completely cover the gloves and then boil the mixture. I've put this round bottom flask of cold water on top to condense the alcohol vapors and reduce losses. As it boils, the alcohol leaches out the diethylhexyl phthalate. This should be done for about an hour or so. After the mixture is cool, filter the mixture and retain the alcohol solution of diethylhexyl phthalate. Here we are. There's a lot of alcohol in it, so boil it or evaporate until it reaches half its volume. When that's finished, we can go to hydrolyzing it. Get an equal volume of water, in this case about 200 milliliters, and add to it about 10 grams of sodium hydroxide, which is available as drain cleaner. Stir it up until it dissolves, and then add it to the alcohol mixture. Turn on the heat, and once again place a flask of cold water over it to condense the vapors and prevent excessive evaporation. Boil the mixture for about half an hour to an hour. What's happening here is that we are performing a base catalyzed ester hydrolysis on the diethylhexyl phthalate to make phthalic acid and 2-ethylhexanol. To help separate the two products, we're using an access of sodium hydroxide, which in turn reacts with the phthalic acid to make disodium phthalate. When that's done, take it off heating and let it cool to room temperature. The mixture will separate into two layers. The bottom layer has the disodium phthalate that we want, and the top layer has the mixture of alcohols. Pour off the alcohol layer, or use a separatory funnel. We won't need the alcohol, so we can get rid of that. Now, with the disodium phthalate solution, we add to it 25 milliliters of concentrated 12 molar hydrochloric acid, also known as muriatic acid. Stir the solution and put it into the refrigerator or an ice bath to cool. The reaction of disodium phthalate with hydrochloric acid produces sodium chloride and phthalic acid. Since phthalic acid has low solubility in cold water, it will eventually precipitate out. Pour off the excess liquid. Now this thalic acid is impure and we want thalic anhydride. So we're going to purify and convert it to thalic anhydride by distillation. Place the thalic anhydride on a hot plate and heat it to boil off the water. Eventually the thalic acid will dry and will melt again as the temperature increases. At this point, place a flask of cold water over the beaker. The thalic acid will dehydrate into thalic anhydride and boil off, where it condenses on the top flask and the sides of the beaker as crystals. When a good amount is deposited, take it off heating and let it cool. You can see inside the cotton candy-like deposit of thalic anhydride. Carefully scoop out dusty thalic anhydride. Be careful not to contaminate it with the impure stuff at the bottom, and then place it into a vial. Go back and vaporize and collect more thalic anhydride until very little comes out. While you're doing it, be careful not to wait too long for it to deposit, or the deposit will get so heavy that it falls back onto the bottom, wasting your time. Eventually, with enough collection, you'll get a sizable quantity of pure thalic anhydride. If your yields are low, you'll need to convert more gloves before continuing. Now we need to nitrate it. We have here a beaker with a glass encapsulated digital thermometer 
and a hot plate stir with a stir bar. Now take 45 milliliters of sulfuric acid and add to it 13 grams of thalcon hydride and 19 grams of sodium nitrate. I got the sulfuric acid from liquid drain cleaner, but if you want to make it yourself, you can do so from previous videos I've made. The sodium nitrate was made in another video from instant cold packs and sodium hydroxide. Anyway, after all the ingredients are added, the mixture will heat up at first by itself, so keep stirring until the temperature stops rising and starts to fall. Now turn on the hot plate and ramp the temperature up slowly over an hour to 110 Celsius. The important thing is not to overshoot. I raise the temperature at a rate of 1 degree per minute. Once it's stabilized at 110 Celsius, continue heating for another hour. A couple of things are happening. First, the sodium nitrate is reacting with the sulfuric acid to make nitric acid and sodium bisulfate. But under these extremely acidic and dehydrating conditions of excess hot concentrated sulfuric acid, the nitric acid reacts to produce nitronium ions. The thalcon hydride reacts with the nitronium ions to nitrate the third position of the aromatic ring. A lot of other products are also produced, like adding the nitro group to the fourth position. But the three nitro product is what we want. Now take it off heating and allow it to cool. The mixture will become thick and gel-like. Scrape it out and pour it into 150 milliliters of cold water. Don't add the water to the acid mixture as the excessive self-heating is dangerous. Vigorously stir the mixture to break up all the chunks and form a slurry. Nitrogen dioxide will be emitted, so this must be done in fume hood. What's happening is the mixture is hydrolyzing, and the 3 nitrothalc anhydride is converting to 3 nitrothalc acid. But more importantly, we're separating it from the various other components such as sulfuric acid, nitric acid, sodium sulfates, 4 nitrothalc acid, and various other organic side products. Most of them are very soluble, while our 3 nitrothalc acid has lower solubility. Anyway, allow the mixture to stand overnight so it fully hydrolyzes. Here we are the next day. Shake and then vacuum filter the mixture. Wash the residue with 250 milliliter portions of water and allow it to dry under an airstream. Scoop it out into a container, and that is 3 nitrothalic acid. Now we condense hydrazine with the 3 nitrothalic acid. First, we need a source of hydrazine. We're going to use the hydrazine sulfate I already made in a previous video using methyl ethyl ketone, ammonia, bleach, and sulfuric acid. So to do the condensation, get 1 gram of 3 nitrothalic acid, 616 milligrams of hydrazine sulfate, and 1.4 grams of sodium acetate trihydrate that we made for our hot ice experiments in another video. Add the ingredients together in one container along with one milliliter of water. Now to heat it up. Set up a digital thermometer, and using a heat gun, we gently boil the mixture until it dries. What's happening is the sodium acetate reacts with the hydrazine sulfate to produce hydrazine acetate and sodium sulfate. Now we add 4 milliliters of brake fluid. Make sure it has a boiling point above 230 Celsius, and that's made from polyethylene glycol. We need to use this as a solvent since the reaction works best at temperatures far above the boiling point of water. Now start heating it up and try to keep it between 200 and 230 Celsius. Continue heating for 10 minutes. If the reaction is working, it'll become dark red. The hydrazine acetate reacts with the 3-nitrothalic acid to produce 3 nitrothalhydroside water, and acetic acid. The water and acetic acid boil off at these temperatures and thus drive the reaction to completion. After 10 minutes of heating, let the mixture cool to below 80 degrees Celsius before handling it. Now we have to turn the nitro group on the 3 nitrothalhydroside into an amine group. After the hydrazine condensation, the mixture is quite gooey, so transfer to a larger container by mixing it and washing it out with water. Add additional water until the total volume is about 100 milliliters. Now add in 13 grams of sodium hydroxide. Shake it up until it completely dissolves. The mixture will turn very dark red as it reacts with the sodium hydroxide. Now add in 10 grams of sodium metabisulfite. This is sold as stump remover or a chemical for home brewing. Mix it in and be sure to break up any large chunks. Add in another 50 milliliters of water and keep mixing until everything is dissolved. Now the next step needs to be done fairly quickly, so everything should be prepared first. Get a round bottom flask of cold water that's bigger than your beaker. We need this to condense the water vapor as the mixture boils later. Also, get a flask or beaker that's small enough to fit inside the larger beaker, but big enough to hold down the aluminum we'll be adding later. Now get a few square feet of aluminum foil, about 5 grams worth, and tear it up into a dozen or so smaller pieces. 
Now get ready. Quickly jam the aluminum foil into the beaker and press down with the flask, then place the cooling flask on top. The reaction starts up as the aluminum foil is dissolved by the sodium hydroxide to produce hydrogen gas. This reaction is very exothermic and heats up to boiling temperatures. This is useful because it helps the aluminum react with the sulfide ions in a complicated reaction to convert the nitro group on the luminol precursor into an amine group. It is this step where we are making luminol. Let the reaction proceed until it stops bubbling. It is still strongly orange meaning it still isn't complete, so open it up and add in another 4 grams worth of aluminum foil and start again, letting it run until it stops bubbling. Repeat the aluminum addition until you see no further color change in the mixture. I added aluminum two additional times for a total of four in this particular run. Now we have luminol, but it's mixed in with a large amount of contaminants, byproducts, and side products, as well as being deprotonated under these alkaline conditions. So we have to do a few steps of separation and acid workup. After stirring the mixture to break up the chunks, filter it out. When all the liquid has gone through, add 50 milliliters of water to the residue to wash out any additional soluble chemicals. This is what the leftover residue looks like with large amounts of aluminum oxide and unreacted aluminum. You won't need this, so throw it away. Now if you look closely at the filtrate, it has these dark floating oils. We don't want the side product, so get a paper towel and carefully dab it away. Alternatively, use a separatory funnel if you have one. Now get a large container with 25 grams of sodium bisulfate. This is normally sold as pH lowering chemical for swimming pools. Dissolve it in a total of 200 milliliters of water, and then add in 100 milliliters of acetone. This is sold as a solvent in hardware stores. Now get the luminol mixture and add it to the acid and acetone solution. Stir it up to thoroughly react the chemicals. The basic sodium aluminates and hydroxides react with the acidic sodium bisulfate to form a slurry of aluminum oxide hydrates and sodium salts. Meanwhile, the luminol is protonated and has increased solubility in the acetone water solution. Now carefully pour off the upper liquid layer into a large evaporating dish. The slurry is waste and may be discarded. Let the luminol solution evaporate until it's dry. Here we are a couple of days later. Break up the cake of luminol and transfer it into a beaker. Wash the dish with a bit of water and get out as much of the luminol as you can and transfer the washings to the beaker. Stir up the mixture and break up the luminol flakes. There should be a fine suspension of luminol but no large pieces. Add in more water if the flakes are not breaking up. I need a total of 100 milliliters of water for my run. What we're doing is washing out any remaining salts from the luminol. Luminol has low solubility in water, but the salt impurities have high solubility. The opposite of the situation with acetone, and this gives us excellent separation of the luminol from the impurities. You can see here the fine suspension of luminol. Now simply vacuum filter the mixture and draw air through it to dry it. And there we have it. Luminol made from domestically available chemicals. Now to test it. The first test is to place a few milligrams in a vial and add about 10 milliliters of water. Only a tiny bit of luminol is soluble in water, but if we shine ultraviolet light on it, we can see it has a strong blue fluorescence compared to regular water. Now add in 200 milligrams of sodium hydroxide. The exact quantity isn't critical. Shake it up and the undissolved luminol should now dissolve. The luminol is no longer fluorescent under basic conditions like this. Now for the ultimate test of chemical luminescence. Get about 5 milliliters of household bleach and turn off the lights. Add it directly in. The flash of blue chemical luminescent light shows that we have successfully made luminol. Granted, it's much easier and cheaper just to buy a glow stick or buy luminol directly online, but our objective here was to demonstrate synthetic organic chemistry using domestically available chemicals and to show the amount of theory and planning that goes into simple synthesis. For those of you looking for a career in organic chemistry, this is the most basic of what you'll have to do. It only gets harder from here. Anyway, that's Luminol. Thanks for watching The Complete Guide.